Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to today's policy talk. I think people will slowly just kind of prickle in, so we'll just slowly do this intro before we get started. Um, thank you for joining us online today on this Friday afternoon. Uh, my name is Miranda Reed. I'm a graduate student at Queen's University and in the public administration program. So I'm happy for the opportunity today to um, host this lecture, but first I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that I'm currently in Kingston, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee uh, peoples. Um, so due to this virtual nature of the talk today, we are all located in different um, places. Um, so I'd like everyone to just take a moment to reflect on the traditional lands that they are situated on, to honor the opportunities and the traditional lands that they are on and the privilege and resources that that has given us and that we get to live on them. Um, so also before I'd like to introduce today's speaker, I wanted to mention that to ask questions today, please submit them by typing into the Q&A feature that you can find on the lower middle section of your screen um, instead of using the raise hand button. So thank you in advance for that. Um, so today's lecture is titled The End of Oil, Energy Policy with a View to Net Zero, presented by Warren Maybe. So Warren is a professor of geography and planning, um, the Canada Research Chair in Renewable Energy Development and its Implementation, and the Director at the Queen's Institute for Energy and Environmental Policy, and the Associate Dean and Director at the School of Policy Studies. So thank you, Warren, for being here. Um, so today, the talk will be focused on the rapid evolution of our economy towards low carbon, net zero approaches to doing business, addressing the roles of, of the provinces and their implications and challenges faced by the oil sector. So this topic is of particular interest, not only due to the new policy directions signaled by the government, but because the issue of how we get our energy and the everyday impact on this has on Canadians is so relevant. So currently, as we are seeing what is happening in Texas, it highlights how effective and well thought out plans for producing energy matter, making accounting for the challenges that come with transitioning between power sources so critical. So I think it is time that I will now hand it off to Warren to do the rest of the talk. So enjoy. Thanks, Warren. Thank you, Miranda. And thanks for everybody for being online. Uh, I hope this is not too repetitive of a talk. I know that I've given versions of this talk uh, in the past and you'll have seen some of the stuff that I show. Some of the graphs that I show will look really familiar. Um, I promise that most of them have been updated uh, but some of the messages really stay the same as we go year to year. So uh, again, if you've seen it already, uh, apologies for that. Uh, okay, so I just have to share my screen here. Here we go. You're gonna see the slides right now. So <clears throat> as Miranda said, I'm gonna talk about the end of oil. I'm gonna talk about what's going on across this kind of Canadian landscape we're into a really interesting period, I think, in Canadian policy. Not only uh, do we have a Canadian government that has said that we are going to move to net zero and do it quickly by 2050, uh, but we now have a, a US government that is seemingly lining up with some of those goals. Uh, many of you will be aware that the Prime Minister met with President Biden uh, last Tuesday. Uh, the big thing that they discussed at their meeting was a, a climate compact for North America. Uh, what that's gonna look like, how it will all shape up, we don't know precisely yet, but we do know that it's, it's the beginning of a, a shift in how um, Canada and the US are gonna work together on the climate file. Uh, it may harken back to the days of the Obama administration and some of the initial discussions that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau had with that administration, uh, it may look different. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit as we go through this lecture. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> what are the big important things that, that we need to think about uh, as we think about uh, energy futures in Canada and as we think about net zero? Well, one thing that's been on everybody's mind uh, for the last month and a half, two months, has been the death of Keystone XL, the second death of Keystone XL, because of course it's died before. Um, when President Biden uh, was on the campaign trail as a candidate, he said many times that Keystone XL was on his list, that he had planned to cancel that project. He planned to essentially pick up 
where the Obama administration had left off, because many of you will remember that the Obama administration had canceled Keystone XL, had, had stopped it on the basis that they felt that the impacts uh, were going to be uh, severe and that it wasn't in line with their strategy for how they wanted to grow out the Canadian or the American economy and the American energy sector. So when Biden was uh, reelected and when he moved into the White House, uh, the very first thing that he did on day one in the office was he put out an executive uh, order. And part of that was uh, declaring that Keystone XL would be stopped. Uh, <clears throat> this has led to a cascading number of opinions and uh, op-eds being published and lots of punditry thinking about, well, what's the future of this uh, energy relation between Canada and the US. Clearly, the US has shifted into a new mode. And that new mode actually goes back by almost a decade. There was a long period, probably a 40 year period between the 1960s and uh, the early 2010s, when Canadian oil and Canadian energy was essential to the US energy independence uh, kind of vision. Uh, America looked at Canadian reserves as being an integral part of their strategy for, for meeting their energy demand and for doing uh, what they needed to do. That is no longer the case. Uh, in the US, the vast growth in shale gas and shale oil has meant that the country is closer to true energy independence than they've ever been, uh, at least in the last 60 or 70 years. And that means that the role of Canadian energy resources and particularly Canadian oil is no longer as critical in that discussion. And this is a real fundamental change in what's going on between our two countries. And it's bubbled up again just in recent weeks uh, in the discussion around Enbridge's Line 5. Line five is an oil pipeline that runs uh, essentially from Wisconsin uh, through to uh, Sarnia in Ontario, travels through Michigan, through the Upper Peninsula, uh, under the Strait of Mackinac, and then down through the Lower Peninsula and under uh, the St. Clair River into uh, Sarnia. There's two major water crossings there. Uh, the Strait of Mackinac is the one that uh, has been of environmental concern for years, actually since this pipeline was built 68 years ago. Um, it has become of greater concern in recent years. There was an anchor strike that damaged one of the anchor points on uh, the underwater crossing of this pipeline a couple of years ago. Uh, it sparked concerns that there could be a spill uh, right at that Strait of Mackinac, which is where uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron come together. So uh, it could be a devastating spill if it were to happen. Uh, governor Whitmer, who is the governor of Michigan, campaigned with a promise that she would close that stretch of the pipeline, which essentially would stop the flow of oil from Western Canada into Sarnia, uh, because something like half of the oil that we're using in Ontario and Quebec travels through that pipeline into Sarnia and into the refineries there. So could have major implications for um, the Canadian economy uh, and particularly the economies of Ontario and Quebec. Uh, it has cropped up as an issue of incredible concern and it is something that uh, not only the Premier here in Ontario and, and in Quebec uh, need to deal with, but I think that the Prime Minister needs to uh, be involved with. So we're going to loop back and, and talk about a couple of these issues, but the fact that we've had Keystone XL cancelled and now this sort of dispute or uh, concern over Line 5 in rapid succession is a signal, I think, of how the relation between Canada and the US is going to proceed. I think that uh, the US is no longer in a position where they desperately need Canadian oil, particularly, or energy writ large. It's no longer the paradigm that is driving this relationship. Now they're in a position where uh, 
it's nice to have it, but they can leave it if they need to. They don't need to grow the supply that much. And they're far less likely to be uh, hospitable to oil or, or even other energy resources traveling through the country, which is a uh, signal, I think, to Canada that we need to rethink our relations with the US in the context of a bigger energy and environment strategy. It's a new day, a new day is dawning for, for how things will be done. So we get into the, the portion of the uh, talk that is gonna seem a little familiar to people, although every year it does change a little bit. Uh, I wanna talk about emissions trends in Canada. Uh, and this graph shows you how emissions have proceeded since 1990 uh, to 2017-18. Uh, which are the latest numbers that are in here. Um, we have essentially gone from emissions that were just over 600 megatons uh, to emissions that are now just over 700 megatons in that 30 year period, 27 year period. Uh, we have seen fairly dramatic growth in emissions, particularly in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. We've seen a couple of you know, kind of inflection points here where uh, emissions have either started to drop or started to rise in the years since then. Those have to do with the recessions and then kind of the restart of the economy. Uh, but we're definitely on an upward trend looking across all of these years. And if we extend this out to 2050, we're on track for roughly 842 megatons per year. Although, the big question is, what did COVID-19 do to those emissions trends? Did we see a massive drop uh, in emissions or are emissions really just you know, gonna stagger a bit and then recover? Uh, about six or seven months ago, I did a presentation as part of the Contagion Cultures talk. And uh, at that point, I actually, uh, was predicting a fairly substantive change in our emissions, particularly over a six month period from March until uh, early fall of, of 2020. Uh, I'm now thinking that the impact is not quite as big as I was thinking then. Uh, I think that we're gonna see a slight dip and then a recovery. And the reason that I think this is that almost everything we've seen in terms of our behavior uh, you know, the, the behavior of our citizens is that people still are driving, manufacturing is still going, uh, there's still a lot of, you know, stuff being moved around. And of course, we're still heating and cooling buildings as we were pre-pandemic, and that is a big part of the overarching uh, emissions profile. So these are things that we need to deal with as we go forward. What happens by 2050 also depends on population growth. So this projection follows <clears throat> current population growth. And we know that actually Canadian population growth will fall off in 2019 and, and 2020, uh, mostly because of the pandemic and what it's done to immigration rates. We're not seeing the same numbers of immigrants uh, landing on our shores simply because they can't get here. Uh, there may be a bounce again uh, in a few years. There are some population projections that are actually much more aggressive, um, you know, looking at gaining, uh, you know, millions more people uh, over the same period. And that would push those overarching emissions up along this trend. Now, <clears throat> the federal government back in November announced that uh, they're working on a strategy and a proposal that will bring us to net zero emissions. The net is an important word, uh, but net zero emissions by 2050. This is actually much faster than some of the more you know, distant uh, thoughts. Uh, there was a, a, a lot of thinking uh, in the years building up to 2019 that it would be the year 2100 that we would try to achieve this net zero goal. Uh, there was a sort of interim target that the government had come up with, which was an 80% reduction in emissions by the year 2050. Uh, we're now thinking that that emissions trend 
uh, needs to be driven down even faster. And that's why the government is talking about uh, net zero by 2050. Net zero does mean that there can be some emissions, uh, but that those emissions need to be offset uh, by increased sequestration or some other kind of carbon capture. So we may still be emitting and what we emit may actually be a substantive number, but it will need to be offset by sequestration. Um, as a climate scientist, I would also say that, you know, if you play too much with that offset mechanism, you could actually undo the whole benefit of net zero. So hopefully that uh, range of flux is not that big that we're looking at uh, absolute emissions that are actually quite close to the zero that, that we're talking about here. Okay, so this is what we've got to get to. Uh, those of you that have seen this presentation before know what's coming next, which is that I'm going to do a wedge analysis and I'm going to talk about how we can actually bring things down to reach that net zero. And the way that we approach this is actually just what I've talked about in other years. Uh, I break this into seven different components, seven important pieces, um, things that we need to do in order to get to that uh, net zero goal. And these are all related to different policy uh, buckets or, or policy drivers that we can use. So we're gonna talk about all of those uh, relatively in, in relatively short order. So the first thing that we can do is we can eliminate coal. Coal is the dirtiest of the fossil fuels by far. Uh, we don't use very much of it in our Canadian energy mix, uh, but where we do use it, it has big emissions. Uh, the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta are still fairly heavily invested in coal as a source for electricity. They burn it in plants in order to generate electricity. Um, Saskatchewan in particular, has been investing in carbon capture and sequestration to offset those emissions. So what I was saying about net zero, that could come into play in this particular uh, instance. Coal is also used heavily in high energy applications. And I'm thinking right now of cement production, steel production, places where you need a very dense energy source, something that can give you very high temperatures if you need to you know, melt rocks or, or do things like that. Uh, so we still have a fair bit of coal in the mix. There are alternatives. There are ways to bring these down. Um, the, uh, the way to bring these things down uh, <clears throat> has to do with switching to alternative sources of fuel or utilizing even electricity inside the processes. This does require fairly major uh, changes to the technologies, and it requires some fairly uh, major investments in new generation capacity, clean generation capacity. The good news on this is that there aren't very many new coal burning facilities built in this country. In fact, most of the facilities would reach the end of their, uh, you know, kind of planned life by about the year 2030, 2040. So eliminating coal faster, taking it off of the grid faster, actually is not too far um, out of sequence with uh, the reinvestment in infrastructure that we should be making anyway. Uh, Ottawa has made some moves. This is now getting to be an old slide, but uh, the current Liberal government or the previous iteration of that Liberal government uh, had announced a plan to eliminate coal-fired electricity by 2030. Um, our experience in Ontario uh, a number of years back now is that if we make a decision to move away from coal, it can actually happen relatively fast. There are ways to bring new uh, generation capacity online in a hurry. And the kind of secret to all of this is that most of the renewables that we're looking at now that could replace coal are actually cheaper on a per kilowatt basis than the coal fired plants themselves. The challenge with this is energy storage. Uh, we simply don't have the energy storage technologies in hand in order to make these changes as quickly as we would like. Um, <clears throat> we still lack policies to move us away from the thermal use of coal, although uh, there are some uh, policies coming out, particularly the clean fuel standard that I'll get to shortly 
which could be applied to coal and which could help us to bring down uh, some of the other emissions. Uh, second thing that we can do is we can electrify cars. Electrifying cars is a good idea uh, as long as the electricity that's used to drive those cars is clean electricity. Uh, and that's true in a lot of provinces, but there are a couple of provinces, uh, particularly Alberta and Saskatchewan, where uh, an electric car on a per kilometer basis may actually have a worse footprint uh, than a, a gas powered vehicle under the existing electrical grid. It's really important that as we look at a transition to electric cars, that we also look at how much energy we need and where it's coming from in our electrical grid. There's some terrific things about electric cars. Uh, you know, not only do they perform well, uh, not only uh, do they uh, require some, to some degree, less maintenance than an internal combustion engine, um, but increasingly we're starting to be aware that those cars have storage capacity that we can use to deal with some of the challenges around renewable energy and some of the issues with uh, having a place to send that energy when nobody is using it. Electric cars at the scale of our fleet, the scale of all of the light duty vehicles that are across the country represents a lot of storage potential. Uh, there have been a number of different incentives over the years. Currently there's a good federal incentive uh, for electric vehicles. Ontario had a really rich incentive for electric vehicles. It's been phased out by the Ford government. Um, Quebec and BC have incentives in place, which uh, all together uh, represent good strategies to help consumers move or make the move. Again, one of the nice things about uh, electrifying our light duty fleet is that most of that fleet would be replaced within the time frame that we're talking about anyway. You know, there's not really a lot of cars that stay on the road 50 years plus, uh, even 20 years plus is rare with, with a lot of vehicles. And so to imagine this transition happening is no longer uh, really a pie in the sky. In fact, I think most people online are probably aware that GM recently announced that by 2035, their fleet would be electric. We know that other car manufacturers are moving in that direction. So this now becomes a very, very feasible and likely scenario where light duty vehicles make this transition. Uh, the second or third piece to this strategy is uh, alternative fuels. I put biofuels, but it just needs to be alternative fuels uh, for the heavy duty fleet that's out there. And by heavy duty, I mean the trucks. I mean everything that is using diesel fuel in this country. We use a lot of diesel fuel. Um, right now, diesel fuel uh, is a major driver of the economy. Uh, it is the primary fuel that's used to move uh, goods from place to place and to get them uh, to the shelves and ultimately to consumers. Uh, there are alternatives for uh, diesel fuel that are out there. There are renewable diesels and biodiesels that can be used. Some of these are plant-based and some of them uh, are really new chemistry uh, solutions, new chemistry alternatives. There are hydrogen solutions that may be efficient in trucks. Um, I always get the question, you know, why don't we just move everything by rail instead because it's so much more effective. Um, I agree that moving things by rail is a very efficient way to move things around. Uh, but I would remind people that building new rail lines takes a long time and given uh, the fact that we don't have corridors into most of our cities where we can run these rail lines easily, uh, it would still require trucks at some point to move things around. So we need to get those trucks uh, off of diesel. Uh, we need to do it in a way that's relatively fast. This is a big investment. There are companies right now that are moving ahead and I do see some of the questions and, and comments coming along. Uh, and yes, I'm aware of uh, you know, Volvo and I'm aware of what Ford is doing. Uh, for light duty vehicles and for small trucks, electrical uh, is a good solution. 
for the heavy duty vehicles, it's not clear as to whether this is going to work or whether we're gonna need a liquid fuel. There are some challenges with energy density and there are some challenges with range that come into effect, particularly in the North America setting. Uh, and so how this goes forward is challenging. I expect it to lag the light duty vehicles by at least a decade. It's gonna take at least another decade to move this forward. And the other thing is, is that those heavy duty trucks um, have longer shelf lives than the light duty vehicles on the roads. They tend to be kept on the road longer uh, because they represent such a big investment. And something that we have to recognize as a nation is that most of these trucks are actually owned by owner operators and the owner operators will require assistance in making this kind of a transformation. Uh, and remember that, you know, these are small businesses that essentially need support. Okay, so moving ahead. Uh, <clears throat> we have not done a good job at providing alternatives to uh, the heavy duty fuels. We're doing a good job, as I say, uh, with batteries, with other fuel alternatives for light duty vehicles. For heavy duty fuels, it's been more difficult. I just put up this graph, it's getting out of date, but if you look at biofuel development, biodiesel development over the years, it has lagged behind. And the reasons that it's lagged behind, well, there's a variety of reasons for it. Um, a lot of it is simply down to the economics. It's been hard to make these alternatives at a price point that the various owner operators can cover. And ultimately that comes back to uh, we, what we as consumers and what we as citizens expect in terms of pricing on the shelves and pricing for goods, all of those goods that we consume have a transport piece inside them in their pricing. And in all of those cases, uh, we are uh, essentially expecting low costs. The clean fuel standard is the policy that I think is going to help us the most uh, in this case. And I've said before, and I'll say again, that I think that the clean fuel standard is the most important climate policy that we have. Uh, the clean fuel standard is designed to bring the greenhouse gas intensities associated with different fuels down year by year towards that net zero goal. As a standard, it's a regulation. It actually forces manufacturers and or fuel producers to ensure that their fuels have a lower and lower greenhouse gas intensity. What that does is it makes sure that we are achieving reductions year on year. Carbon pricing doesn't do it as well. And I'll get into that a little bit more as we go forward. Carbon pricing works well if it's aggressive, but governments are often reluctant to make those prices aggressive and to make them uh, you know, equivalent to what needs to be the price in order to get the change in behavior. We can do better in some cases by using a regulatory uh, arm or as we're doing in Canada by combining regulation through something like the clean fuel standard with carbon pricing uh, which, of course, is the strategy that we're developing now. Um, yeah, we can skip past that. The next piece is probably the most important piece, uh, and it goes beyond what I've been talking about uh, when it comes to, you know, fuel shifting and energy shifting. And it starts to get at uh, the real crux of the problem. Canadians consume a lot of energy. And we consume a lot of energy uh, on a per capita basis. Those of you that have taken my classes, uh, I always put up the stats at the beginning, but the important numbers to remember are 2% and 0.5%. Canada consumes 2% of the world's energy with 0.5% of the world's population. We're not in line with a global average. <laughs> the global average is, is actually very, very low. Uh, we're not even in line with the average uh, footprints of some of our peers in Europe uh, and some of our peers in places like Scandinavia. So uh, these are other countries that have very similar types of uh, 
climate and end economies. We need to achieve overarching energy reductions on a per capita basis uh, about fivefold. So we need to get our energy consumption down on a per capita basis, uh, down to something like 20% of what we use today. It's very doable. <laughs> new technologies are getting us in, into that range. Uh, you know, a new light bulb, an LED light bulb, will actually have a much, much uh, lower footprint uh, per lumen of light that's coming out. It will give us many, many options in terms of uh, new technology will give us many options in terms of how to achieve these reductions. But we need people to commit to it. And there is a large lived life piece to this. There is a large piece of you know, uh, individual decisions and individual actions. And how we capture this becomes more and more important in almost every projection I've ever run. You know, technology will only get us about halfway to where we need to be, and the rest is going to go with human behavior. Now, the probably the best tool to deal with that is carbon taxes. And carbon taxes, or carbon pricing, I should say, uh, are, you know, economy-wide and can help guide decisions and guide uh, the, the actions of consumers. Uh, our carbon pricing right now is in that $30 to $40 range. Uh, we'll get to $50 next year for uh, our, our national kind of carbon price. Uh, $50 is not enough in some sectors to make a significant change. Uh, $50 a ton translates into, you know, a measurable price increase at the pump, but is it enough to make people stop driving? It translates into a measurable increase on your electric bill or your natural gas bill, but is it enough to make you reduce your electricity use or to change your furnace to something different? Probably not. Uh, these are good tools to help people make individual decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. But for some of the really big transformations, we're gonna need other programs to help people over this hump. And of course, it doesn't help that we have a number of provinces that have lined up against carbon pricing, although that opposition seems to be waning as the years go on. Uh, the big concern, I guess, right now among some uh, conservatives on the federal side is that Aaron O'Toole, as leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, uh, may flip-flop on carbon pricing and, and agree that carbon pricing uh, should be part of a future strategy. This would be a major breakthrough for the Conservative Party and, and I think a necessary breakthrough for them. Um, and it would help go a long way to ensuring that we keep this tool in our toolbox as we move forward. Uh, yeah, carbon taxes can help with conservation. A couple more things to talk about before I open this up for discussion. Green electricity. Green electricity is happening right now. We are transforming our electrical grid year on year, um, whether we want to or not uh, in many ways. Um, if we go back in time 12 or 15 years, uh, there was a lot of discussion about what kind of incentives we should put in place in order to get more solar power, more wind power, more other types of renewables into our mix. Ontario had uh, the Green Energy and Green Economy Act, which was much maligned by some and much loved by others. Uh, it provided a number of different tools, including the feed-in tariff, which uh, drove a lot of new electricity development within this province. Other provinces have used different policy tools. Uh, for instance, Alberta has done a lot to uh, use the auction mechanism to bring new electricity into the mix. What's happened over 12 years is that the technologies have gotten cheaper and cheaper for uh, electric, uh, for new electric uh, generation capacity. Uh, solar panels continue to get cheaper year on year. Solar panels uh, are also getting more efficient. 
uh, as we start to move towards um, you know, broader implementation. We're starting to see solar panels integrated into things like roof systems, which make it easier for them to be uh, basically put into place. We're also seeing them put into car roofs and we're seeing uh, experiments with putting solar panels into roads that I think could move that technology forward even faster. Um, just as an aside, uh, one of the things that nobody ever thinks about when we think about the end of oil is that the end of oil also means the end of asphalt. Uh, and we will need to come up with better ways to make roads in a post-oil economy. Uh, and I'm actually a big fan of the idea that we make our roads into solar systems, that they are actually generating energy for us uh, and providing that kind of a service. Bit of an aside, but, but I think it's interesting. Green electricity already beats fossil fuels in most applications. The challenge with green electricity is storage. I think that we have the solutions for storage, particularly with fuel cells and hydrogen. Um, it's not something that everybody agrees on. And there's a number of new storage technologies that are being rolled out. I already said when I was talking about electric vehicles that one of the really nice things about electric vehicles is that they could form a rolling storage grid as we get more and more of them available. And that may be the direction that things go. Most likely we'll have a hybrid solution that has lots and lots of different mechanisms for storing energy, both on a day-to-day -day basis and hopefully on a seasonal basis. Um, <clears throat> every province has a vision for what they're gonna do in the future of their, their electricity mix or their energy mix. Uh, the big problem that we have is that in Canada, of course, it means we have 13 different visions for the future of energy and in some cases they're not particularly synergistic you know we haven't really thought about how we can use different types of energy in different parts of the country in a really systematic and and comprehensive way there's work that needs to be done to link these things up to make them as effective as they can be um, and of course we're seeing lots of backtracking on different policies so a couple of years ago, we had the Ford government rolling in and canceling uh, energy projects. Uh, ironically, I, I don't actually think that some of these cancellations were bad. You know, we had actually locked into some contracts that didn't make a lot of sense from long term grid development perspectives. And, you know, unwinding a few contracts may have made sense. In the long run, I don't think that we're going to see a lot of new fossil fuel development when wind is available and when we can see that move forward. I haven't even talked about nuclear, but there's a lot of effort being put into the nuclear side of things and particularly small modular reactors. It's not part of an immediate solution because there's probably a decade of development in front of us, but it could be part of a long term um, energy solution. And then, yeah, so the storage options, and I do see a couple of the questions about the lifetime of batteries and how we do that. Uh, there's some really interesting research, by the way, uh, happening here at Queens, looking at battery recycling and getting the lithium and the cobalt and the magnesium and other elements back so that we can do other things with those materials. Net zero buildings. <laughs> so <clears throat> I put this in last, um, or second last, because net zero buildings is one of those things that we, we know how to get there, but the cost is going to be tremendous. Uh, net zero buildings essentially are buildings that uh, produce as much energy as they use. There are actually quite a few different definitions of net zero buildings. That's the definition, definition that I'm using. Uh, a building that generates as much power as it uses. It may not generate all of that power at the time that the building needs it. So there may need to be storage or there may need to be sharing power back and forth between different sources. Uh, net zero buildings uh, you know, can use a lot of different technology solutions to achieve that net zero moment. Uh, you can have uh, renewable energy replacing conventional energy coming in. 
You can have better insulation, which reduces energy requirements. Uh, you can do thermal insulation, which means you're uh, building and designing your buildings to absorb heat from the sun during the day and to radiate back at night. There are many different ways that we can achieve this, but we have a lot of buildings in Canada. I don't know if people have noticed. Uh, right now, <clears throat> the challenge is not so much with single family homes where the technology solutions have been tested, if not applied. The big problems will be with the multi-story, multi-unit homes uh, and buildings that are being built across the country. Even in Kingston, we have four or five of these types of buildings under construction. And all of them, or almost all of them, represent a future problem that we're going to have to deal with. Unfortunately, within about a 30-year window, if we truly want to achieve this net zero moment. There are only a few ways to make a tall building net zero. You know, we can look at incorporating solar panels into the skin of the building. So into the windows and walls of the building itself. Um, we can look at using uh, thermal PV or sorry, thermal, solar thermal uh, solutions where uh, the buildings are absorbing some of that energy. We can insulate them better in order to reduce those energy uh, consumption requirements. But retrofitting a tall building is difficult. Vancouver went through this back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, early 2000s, where buildings that had been built over a 10-year period prior to that uh, were found to be failing in terms of their vapor barriers and their water um, barriers. They essentially were leaky condos. They were not designed for the climate in which they were built. And a lot of retrofitting had to happen. There were a lot of buildings that were scaffolded and swaddled and, and then basically reclad during that period. Very expensive developments, very expensive uh, retrofits. Can we do that to every tall building that we've built in the country uh, over the next 30 years? Or will we just have to make up the energy that they require through different means? That's a question that is ongoing right now. We have about 15 million structures, individual structures across this country. There's a lot of buildings out there. Maybe not every one of those buildings needs to get to net zero, but we need to move a lot of them in that direction. The cost is going to be very high. The good news about that is that the costs go right back into our economy for the most part. This is paying people to do retrofitting and insulation in your house. This is paying people uh, to do work. Uh, in order to move things forward. So there is a potential economic benefit that goes with this retrofitting. Um, <clears throat> but we need both single family and multi-story options for this. And you know that will require building code adaptation. It will require uh, new technologies, new materials. I'm not sure how much of that we can achieve by 2050. The very last thing I want to talk about, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions, it's the ideas around green agriculture uh, and green forestry options, options that could help us to uh, reduce carbon footprints in those sectors. Right now, uh, agriculture and forestry is about 10% of our emissions, give or take, mostly agriculture. Uh, maybe even turn it into a sink. Uh, for carbon. So better land management practices that could sequester carbon on the landscape. More likely a potential in forestry than in agriculture that we could move in that direction. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of work done in this space. <clears throat> so this is a picture of somebody doing low-till or no-till agriculture where you're not plowing up the landscape every time you want to plant a different crop. However, these are uh, big and complicated ecological systems. And the one thing that I will say is that if we in Canada want to sequester more carbon in our forests, 
it actually doesn't mean doing less forestry and just letting the trees grow more. It means doing more active forest management than we do right now. Because Canadian forests and Canadian agriculture are subject to ongoing climate change. They are being affected by changing climactic conditions. Uh, we're seeing more wildfires, more pests, more events that are disturbances on the landscapes that are releasing carbon. Uh, it is tilting, particularly our forests, into a source of carbon rather than a sink for carbon on the landscape. The management that is required to turn it back into a sink means going out and being active on the landscape. And that's actually a statement that's in opposition to what a number of the environmental groups that are out there want to see. Uh, there's a number of people who believe that we should be doing more active conservation on the landscape. Um, we could do that, but I think that it would actually lead to increased emissions, at least in the short term. So <clears throat> we're at the end here. These are all of the action plan components that need to be in place. Looping back around, bringing this all full circle, I started with the idea that the Liberals have announced that we're going to be moving to net zero emissions by 2050. They have said that you know they're tabling uh, legislation on this that says that the government needs to report uh, and that that reporting will start in 2030. I think it should start in 2025, but that's what they have asked for. Uh, <clears throat> the government needs to develop a plan and it will be uh, available later this year. In my opinion, the plan has to have all these pieces. I don't think we can get to net zero unless we put all these pieces in place. Having said that, I think that we can get there. I'm optimistic on the idea that we can achieve net zero in this country by 2050. I think we have the know-how. I think we've got the, the resources. And, and most importantly, I think we now finally have the societal will to push ourselves in that direction. So I'm optimistic and in fact, enthusiastic about being able to make this change. And that's where I'm gonna stop this lecture or this, this seminar so that we have a few minutes to uh, address some questions. So Miranda, are you uh, back? Oh, you're back, there you are, I see you. I'll stop uh, yeah, you. so thank you, Warren. That was a great talk, virtual round of applause. Um, so we'll start the question period now. So with the first one, is there a particular policy we should be pursuing to increase the proportion of renewable renewables in our energy mix? So it's a great question. Um, right now, I think we're doing a lot of what needs to be done. Uh, it's happening at a provincial basis. One of the things that I would like to see in this net zero plan that the government is putting out uh, is some kind of requirement that the provinces, you know, address this really, really directly, you know, how much of renewable is in the energy mix, the electricity mix, province by province. People often confuse the words energy and electricity. You know, we use them synonymously. In fact, uh, Ontario often puts out what they call the long-term energy plan. It's a long-term electricity plan. It's not energy writ large. Uh, <clears throat> we need to be cognizant that, yes, electricity is likely to be that common currency, that lingua franca of the future. Um, we need to develop a green electricity grid that can supply the energy that we need. We need to make transformations in the transport sector, so where we use uh, diesel fuels and gasolines, and we need to do it in the heating sector where we use natural gas and propane. So there's a number of linked policies. That's why I tried to go through all these different sectors here in order to make that transformation. Okay, great. Um, so 2050 is the projected um, kind of goal date, which is pretty far away, it's in 30 years. So is there a feasible way that we can accelerate lowering our emissions? Um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> the best thing to do in very, very short order is to, um, you know, not only speed up the adoption of technologies. And I'm one of those people that sort of thinks, you know, most of these technologies are there now. They're, 
they're on the shelf in some shape or form. It's just a question of getting people to implement them. If we want home renovations to go faster, provide incentives to get people to do it. If we want to change the building codes, well, let's get out and, and change them and have a framework so that they can aggressively be changed uh, within these windows. I do think that we need to get people using less energy on their own earlier. That's one of the actual faults of the model that I've presented is that um, I run a lot of different projections of future emissions in the lab. And the projection that I ran there basically rolls out new technologies and then calculates how much of a gap there is between the new technologies and where we're trying to get to and backfills it with conservation. The right thing to do, and you know, I, I present it this way on purpose so people can point out how wrong it is. The right thing to do is to forward load the conservation, do more conservation now and build the technologies in as required. Uh, so that's what I would really like to see some tools to help people make those transitions uh, a little bit earlier. Okay, so next question is, how do we control the cost of overruns that have been seen in large scale hydro projects? So examples that um, the question uses is muskrat falls and site C that have been shown by economic reports that if they continue, will not be able to be viable. Yeah. One of the things that we need to have a discussion about very soon is as we develop this future energy mix, which will be dominated by electricity. I think that almost every expert agrees on that. Not everyone, but almost everyone agrees that electricity will be the main thing that we're using. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, debate over whether it should be one big, complicated, integrated grid. I'm doing this with my hands. You know, it's big and, and complicated and, and stretches from coast to coast or stretches from uh, Nunavut down to Mexico, you know, allows us to shunt electrons wherever they need to be used. Or should our grids be small and local? And yes, there are interconnections, but the primary focus of a local grid is just to serve, uh, support that local community, the local industry, the local applications. If we do things on that small and local basis, we're not gonna have too many of these mega projects. And the reason we're not gonna have the mega projects is that at a local scale, very few localities, municipalities, you know, communities need all that much power. A muskrat falls or a site C is designed to feed uh, dozens of communities, major ec uh, industrial activities, lots of different things. If we start thinking about our grid on that island scale, uh, and we start thinking about how do we generate our energy locally for local consumption, with some backup, some interconnection for backup. It's a very different outlook and it would get us away from the mega projects and it would focus us more on smaller projects that are easier to cost manage. So next question, do you feel that the carbon tax rebates are an effective way of lessening the impact on lower income earners? Um, that's a good question because you know, one of the challenges with a carbon tax is that it impacts a lower income Canadian more so than it impacts a higher income Canadian. A higher income Canadian can choose to pay it and, uh, you know, just do whatever they choose to do, or they can afford to live in a place where they don't have to commute and they can afford to walk to work instead of driving the 401, you know, uh, and, and commuting across the city every morning. Um, so a rebate system can be effective. This is part of the reason that I'm less a fan of the carbon tax or the carbon price as a be all end all. I think that we use the carbon pricing as a signal to help consumers make wise choices. But the flip side to it is that we need to provide wise alternatives. One way to do it is to not so much give money back every single time that we take a tax away from somebody, but to invest that money in the wise alternatives. I was giving the example of people that have to drive across the city. Well, the wise alternative is a form of public transit that can get them back and forth efficiently, and this is important, 
timely and comfortably, you know? So we're not saying let's get everybody on the Finch bus, which is overcrowded, not timely, not efficient. We're talking about providing good alternatives that are low emission or no emission, if possible, that can move people around to where they need to get to. Um, it's amazing to me, by the way, how many transit planners don't think about where people want to go in their planning. Uh, and I applaud the city of Kingston for reinventing its transit in the last 10 years uh, to introduce lines that actually do go where you want to go and increasing ridership in a small city uh, on a pretty fantastic basis. So. Okay, great. So the next question, so what would a carbon regulation look like that would be more effective on industrial emitters rather than individual households? Yeah, and this is a good question and it is uh, an important one because individual households do not have the financial wherewithal or the borrowing capacity to make immediate changes and, and move things around. Uh, I think that what we need are layered types of policies. We need a regulation that says that, you know, the fuels and the products that people are producing are gonna be less greenhouse gas intensive. And you can draw a straight line from how greenhouse gas intensive is today to zero and that can be the line you know, to 2050. You can put some curves in it, some inflections. You can do the things that you need to do, um, but you apply that to the big emitters, the big producers, um, work with the car manufacturers. They're an important bunch. Work with the truck manufacturers. You know, um, I've been watching a lot of the comments and, and Bill Lambert, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, there's a couple points where I think we're still uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, particularly with the trucks, but you know, we, can, we can get to that. I think that it's those types of regulations that are really going to impact the large emitters, and there can be a cutoff so that the uh, regulation doesn't apply to the very small emitters, the individual households. Remember that the individual households, for the most part, were purchasing the electricity and we're not making anything, you know, other than garbage. Uh, <clears throat> we're, not, we're not manufacturing, we're not doing a lot of that in the households. We do want to get the individual households to the point that they can uh, make the choices, do the insulation, swap out the furnace for the heat pump, you know, do all of the, the steps that are going to be required to get us to close to net zero. Okay, and I think this will be the last question. Sorry to everyone who has asked questions, like they're all really good, but we are approaching one. So um, just as an encompassing last question, what do you think living net, in net zero in 2050 will look like in the major ways for everyday living for Canadians? What a great question. Uh, I don't know who asked that one, but it is a great question because I think that uh, it's not gonna seem a whole lot different than what we're living in today with a few exceptions. You know, number one, I think that people are going to be a lot more discerning about how often they hop into a vehicle and drive somewhere and how often they move around. Uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, we're going to see people thinking a little bit more about that. <clears throat> I'm very hopeful that the retrofitting that's going to be required will also allow us to re-examine kind of the sprawl on our landscapes and how our cities are formed. You know, is there a good reason why there is a single downtown Toronto? Some of you will remember years ago, there was a plan to have five city centers in Toronto, one for North York, one for Scarborough, one for Etobicoke. You know, you can work your way around. It never really took off. Why is that? Why can't we have kind of community centers, not a community center, but a community center of business where you can come together for that day-to-day -day interaction, day-to-day -day work. Um, you don't need to bring everybody into a few hundred hectares and then let them leave every night in order to do things. We've seen that in the way that we're working now. So I think that that's the other big change is that we'll have people living in a lot more places. There'll be a lot more video uh, and remote conferencing there will be maybe more incentives not to zip around at a, the drop of a hat, a little bit more deliberate planning and thinking. Um, and I think that we're going to be enjoying a very high standard of living. So uh, I'm very optimistic. 
Okay, great. Well, we had some great questions and great answers. So thank you to everyone for joining us today. I think we had some great discussions and all learned some new things. I'm a big thank you to Warren. I know you're a busy man. So taking the time to share this information with us was really great. And yeah, I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, I hope everyone has a great Friday afternoon and thanks for joining us. And thanks to everybody for coming and asking questions. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. All right. Bye everyone. Bye now.